To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Now, I want to share with you some of our ideas, some of the philosophy for Disney World. I've always said there will never be another Disneyland, and uh, I think it's going to work out that way. So that there is a distinction between Disneyland in California and whatever Disney does in Florida. Well, it sounds pretty good. In fact, that's just the right spirit. Here in Florida, we have something special we never enjoyed at Disneyland. The blessing of size. There's enough land to hold all the ideas and plans we can possibly imagine. W. my friend, fellow Disney enthusiast, dreamer, and doer, welcome to the WDW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangiello, and this is episode number 752, and together, as we have been since 2004, we're going to celebrate the magic of the Disney parks, movies, and more, help you have the best possible vacation experience when you go to the parks, and bring you a little bit of Disney magic wherever you are. Here on the podcast, my weekly live video on Facebook every Wednesday night, blog, events, weekly newsletter, and more. Please join the community and find everything at www.radio.com. So have you ever wondered what pivotal moments helped to shape the Disney legacy? Well, as we celebrate Disney 100 and the 100 years of magic from the Walt Disney Company, we're going to deep dive into the top 10 milestone moments that created this legacy of dreams and transformed the world of entertainment forever. Our journey is going to take us from first steps through triumphs, tribulations, and transitions, and from individual moments to monumental shifts. We're going to look at not only how they got us here, but their continuing impacts on the future and the people that made the dreams a reality. Then stay tuned for our Disney trivia question of the week, and more updates at the end of the show. And if you like what you hear, please share the show and tell a friend. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. Ladies and gentlemen, the creator of Mickey Mouse and the Silly Symphony cartoons, Mr. Walt Disney. But it was not until Walt Disney made the first cartoon in sound, ladies and gentlemen, that Mickey attained star proportions. That film was called Steamboat Willie. Anyway, how do you feel about it? Well, Mr. DeMille, any picture's a gamble. But we're betting three quarters of a million dollars that Snow White will be good entertainment. My bet's on you. Do you remember the ABC after-school specials? Like, where they always start off with, on this week's very special episode, well... For WDW Radio, this is one of those as well. So on this week's special episode of WDW Radio, we're going to journey through the enchanting tapestry of Disney's legacy from a humble studio in Los Angeles to a global entertainment empire. The Walt Disney Company has captivated our hearts and imaginations for a century in countless ways. But what were some of the pivotal moments that made this all happen. Well, this week, we're going to explore those top 10 milestone moments that have defined the Disney's illustrious 100-year history. From the birth of an iconic mouse to groundbreaking theme parks and game-changing acquisitions, join us as we explore the magic, challenges, and innovations that have made Disney the storytelling titan that it is today. And joining me once again is someone who has been part of WW Radio's nearly 20-year and 750-plus episode history. He puts the Tim in top 10 because he is little Timothy Foster from Celebrations Magazine. I thought I was going to get a crossover, a titan of Disney history crossover, but you went with my name. You You went with my name. That's good. Okay. And I said, as we were getting ready to record, I said, Someday soon, we'll look back and we'll do the top 10 milestone moments in the 100-year celebration of Celebrations Magazine. Celebration. We should just do that now. 
this show, <laughs> this right here, number 36. Okay. It really is going to throw off my whole Disney 100 motif <laughs> that I'm going for here. <laughs> exactly. So we didn't, um, as always, we didn't talk about this ahead of time, but I did. I was sort of inspired by this celebration of Disney 100. And I think as we embark on what is going to be a very nostalgic journey through Disney's storied past, I think it's 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 essential almost to recognize the sheer impact of some of these moments because every milestone we're, we're about to share not only helped shape the trajectory of the company, but also, you know, not to sort of be too sort of hyperbolic about it, but it really left an indelible mark on global pop culture. Like these are pivotal chapters in Disney's own story. And there's events that have helped make us laugh and cry and dream and believe in this magic we talk about so often. And I think these are just 10 ish of countless moments, big and small that have made not just magic, but have changed lives my own included. And, you know, Tim, we didn't talk about this ahead of time in terms of how we approached it. But when I suggested this topic and Disney 100 and, and sort of these top 10 milestone moments, what was the first thing that came to mind? How did you sort of decide to approach it and then go right into what you feel is your your first of 10 ish important milestone moments in Disney history? Well, it's a, it's a topic that's on our minds a lot lately. So I've been wrestling with this. Uh, actually, the first thing I thought was there's a lot of obvious ones and I guess we'll hit them, but I feel like we know the obvious ones. Let's maybe dig a little deeper and find the not so obvious ones that were just as impactful, but not well known. We all know the parks opened and da, 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 da. Although I'm sure we will get there, but so I, I just thought we would go way back because as you were talking I was reflecting on how a lot of the milestones we're going to talk about, they're not just milestones in Disney's history. These are milestones in entertainment history, animation history. And for all you kids out there who don't know that Walt Disney was an actual person, he really was. It's, it's, um, it is interesting to look back and realize that Walt Disney wasn't just a, an innovator in animation of something that was already going on. He and, and several of the people that he worked with basically invented this. Um, and that that's that's a fun, interesting thing to note. So I will start my list with going way back to the 1920s to, and I'll say it this way, when Walt Disney was fired. We'll put it that way. <laughs> and for a lot of reasons. Actually, there's a few instances of this. And one, there's a constant thread. And we might pick on a few of these instances where Walt Disney and the studio in general is seemingly having a, having a rough go of things. Things look bleak. And then something miraculous happens um, that changes the course of the company. And one of the first things was when, and the story is well known, but when Walt Disney went to New York to visit with um, Universal, Charles Mintz to get his Oswald the Lucky Rabbit contract extended and was told, oh, no, no, we're not extending your contract. You're actually getting a pay cut. We've hired all of your animators away. And oh, by the way, that Oswald character belongs to us, not to you. And Walt Disney travels home, dejected, having lost his character, his team, and seemingly his business. Mickey Mouse is born. Um, as we all know, the stories are legend. My my favorite version is when he declared that the character's name was Mortimer and Lillian said, that's a stupid name for a mouse. We're going to call him Mickey. Um, but it's one of the first, actually not the first, but one of the most early examples of Walt Disney being confronted with a seemingly insurmountable obstacle and instead turning it into an opportunity to not only carry on, but to take himself and the studio to uh, loftier places they'd never been before. Mickey Mouse, of course, going on to become Mickey Mouse. It all started with the mouse and so on. So that's the first stop on my journey is when Walt Disney was fired, more or less. So I love that. And I love that you are looking to some of the, you know, almost potentially more obscure ones where I actually went to some of the more obvious ones, but really wanted to 
dig a little deeper into them. But I did have the introduction, obviously, of Mickey Mouse in 1928 as marking this, you know, what really became the birth of a global icon. And, and a lot of things I found that I focused on, Tim, were seemingly small things that had monstrous amounts of impact. And I think, you know, this, which I which I obviously did have on my list, it it this was not just the introduction of an individual character that was among the first ever to be extensively merchandised, right? We know about mm. the toys and the watches and and comic strips and and really Mickey was sort of the first character, <clears throat> excuse me, to become a merchandising phenomenon and would sort of be a model for character-based merchandising that Disney and other companies would follow for decades. I think more importantly, he became not just a symbol of the company and the face of Disney, but it is the most recognizable corporate logo that represents this company worldwide. I think what this did too, right, from a business perspective was it provided the foundation for all of the success that Disney would have after. It it gave the studio the stability and the recognition that it needed to grow. It obviously led to the creation of other iconic characters. But, you know, Mickey Mouse has sort of transcended animation and as a corporate symbol to become a cultural icon. You know, if you think about the way Mickey has been referenced in countless forms of art and media and fashion and the influence the character has had on other artists and filmmakers and designers, not to mention paving the way for all the other things that the Disney company would do. And we'll sort of get to things like the theme park, et cetera. But it was more than just the birth of a single character. Um, and I think, you know, his, the fact that his enduring appeal, <clears throat> excuse me, and adaptability um, really sort of solidified his status as a, a timeless icon. And obviously it needed to be on the list because it played such a pivotal role in the success and the ongoing influence of the Disney company as a whole. It does irk me to this day when people say Mickey Mouse in terms of what a Mickey Mouse operation it is. <laughs> in a mean way. I wish I, I had a Mickey Mouse operation, that. right? Like well, it should be know, a good thing. I think I take that as a compliment. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, so I, I went, um, you know, a lot of things I think I find on my list, I, I looked at from, <clears throat> excuse me, not just a Disney perspective, but almost from uh, personally, from a sense of, of entrepreneurial inspiration. And the first item that was on my list is actually something that we celebrated or maybe you didn't celebrate it, but sort of quietly celebrated <laughs> Just a few days ago, which was in 1923, Walt and Roy founding the Disney Brothers Studio in Los Angeles. Right. So you talked about this story and I love, you know, and, I, and when I I give a lot of, of presentations at conferences and events and for corporations I'm talking about Walt Disney's legacy and, and and leadership lessons we can learn from Walt Disney. And you talked about, like, I want to interview the guy that fired Disney from a newspaper for lack of creativity. Like, I want that's the <laughs> guy I want to talk about. But, you know, before 1923, when he was working in Kansas City and he faced bankruptcy, like, over and over again, and, you know, with the Laughagram Studios, the fact that he faced adversity over and over and over again, even after he started to have, you know, mild and then major successes. But when he was joined by Roy, who clearly had a very keen business acumen that maybe did that was not Walt's strongest suit. Um, the formation of this studio and what led them to get there, right? I, I love, you know, my dad was my inspiration, but from a business perspective, so was Walt because of the risks they took, the leaps of faith, more importantly, the belief that they had in what they were doing. And you know, they take a loan from their uncle, they they buy some secondhand equipment and they set up a studio in the back of a small real estate office, uh, you know, like in Los Angeles, which was originally named the Disney Brothers Studio, became the Walt Disney Studio. Now is obviously the, the Walt Disney Company. And that first real, quote unquote, success they had was with the creation of the Alice Comedies. But again, this small little space that 
small little bit of success was that first sort of domino to fall and and be sort of the genesis of what would become the most influential entertainment company in the world. Right. It's not about where you start. Right. It's about where you end up and whether, you you know, especially if and I think about this from a, 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 a business inspirational perspective. Right. You know, when you when you're scrapping to try and just get your start and all the things that it came that came from that, not just with the introduction of other characters, but the innovations in animation and the business model that developed from that, right? With with Roy's business strategies, Walt Creative Genius, you know, establishing a business model that is so it's the blueprint for repeatability, right? It's the it's the balancing of creativity and profitability and that synergy that the brothers had laid the groundwork for not just immediate success, but sustained success and and the foundation of that studio back in 1923, I think sometimes over gets overlooked because it's not sort of this high profile, like, you know, thing that you can sort of celebrate, but that was the pivotal moment. Like for me, that sets the stage for not just Disney's global brand recognition, but really the century long legacy. And, you know, nothing else happens without that. And, Hey, in a humorous way, solves the mystery for many people. Why is D23 called D23 anyway? So <laughs> right. there you go. So in case you wonder. But um, yeah, well said. It's actually funny because I, I realized as I was doing research for my own pieces on the 100-year celebration, I know about the Alice comedies. I've seen stills. I I know the lore. I never realized I've never actually seen an Alice comedy. Stop it. No, that's and it. I, you need to come I mean, over. We're gonna get some snacks. No, well, well, I have. I found. I found oh. them, and and it's it's they're they're fun. I mean, it was fun to watch, but I, I will say for anybody, and I'm going to jump ahead a few years. I don't know if you're going to go back into the 20s and 30s, but for anybody who hasn't seen, uh, you know, the Alice comedies or even Oswald or or Steamboat Willie or Flowers and Trees or any of those, like uh, with Disney Plus and the magic of the internet and all that, we can see these things again so do go check them out if you haven't seen them and i i would venture to say a lot of newer disney fans probably don't even know about these things and uh, and actually if you watch them they're compared to today they're just fun they're fascinating donald duck in his first cartoon cannot be tough, but um <laughs> still no, but I, i'm still gonna, no pants I, well yeah i mean we won't talk about that actually we just did talk about that but that's okay we'll move ahead I'm going to jump forward to the 1940s. And this is another another time where Walt Disney and the studios themselves were in a bit of a uh, bit of bit of trouble. And so that we're talking we're at the end of the latter half of the 1940s. World War II has come and gone that had a massive impact on the studios in lots of ways they lost European revenue for the film so the money wasn't coming in the studios themselves uh got uh, uh taken over for the war effort uh, in various ways Walt Disney made his trip to South America there was an animator strike which they got through but left scars that I don't think ever really went away for the company and Walt Disney so you're entering the 1950s at a crossroads here. You haven't done a feature film, full-length feature film in quite a long time. This is when the package films were there, mm. fun and fancy free, make my music, and so on and so forth. Money was scarce, not sure what to do. And this is when one of the greatest films in Disney history, not just the greatest, but the most impactful and maybe the most important films came in 1950 in the form of Cinderella. And... This film, much like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs before it, is so important, not just from an artistic standpoint, just from a historic standpoint, not only saved, basically saved the studio, um, because it was a wild, wildly successful, gave them a great influx of cash that they sorely needed at the time, um, set the company on a path to bigger and better things in the 50s, which I'm sure we will talk about. There was a little park that opened a few years later. And really, though, set the stage for the princess film. Now, Snow White is a Disney princess, of course, but I think the the concept of the Disney princess and the Disney princess film 
really did get started with Cinderella. And of course, we know the, the castle has become the very icon, the very logo of Walt Disney World, Walt uh, Disney Studios, and so on. So uh, I, I put Cinderella as uh, my next important event for not only saving the company, but for doing a lot to, as Mickey Mouse did, set a lot in place for the the imagery and the um, the branding of the company for untold years going forward. Well, I, I think you're right, right? I, again, if you want to sort of deep dive into the significance of Cinderella from a character's perspective, starting to pave the way for this, the iconography of, <clears throat> excuse me, Disney princesses. But you're right. It, it also helped to literally reverse the studio's fortunes or lack thereof. It also did things like receive Academy Award nominations. Like it, it Disney, you know, yeah. again, you talked about things like the importance of, of Snow White, which, which came very, very, very close to making my list because it was the first full length animated film and, and, and what that meant. But I think to your point about what Cinderella did, I think it is almost overlooked in terms of the impact that it, it ended up having for not just the Walt Disney company, but animation as a whole. And uh, again, this, this lo- this continuing legacy of the quote unquote Disney princess. Yeah. I mean, the, the, like again, the idea of of the princess, you know, did technically start with Snow White, but I think really came to the fore with Cinderella, uh, and so on, and the castle. My goodness, <laughs> the castle and the merchandise, right? <laughs> and the merchandise, <laughs> Just, you know. and Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique. Well, I mean, and, it is and, because and it, it is. It, you know. I think I think it was one of the films that really started to you know beyond sort of Mickey and the Fab Five characters. Cinderella was one of the things that led to this this continuing introduction of new lines of merchandise, which continues to further boost the company's revenue, right? It's not just about it being a box office success, which which helped to to ensure this the, the financial stability of the company, but what it yeah. meant to and I think it really was it was the introduction of of, you know, this this new golden age of animation, which led to things like Peter Pan and Sleeping Beauty and, and Little Mermaid, et cetera. So. And I think, too, it did a lot to, um, maybe from the public's point of view at the time, to reinstill uh, the, the confidence, let's say, in Disney. Because the, the years had been lean. And then that fun and fancy freeze and the Make My Music and Three Comedy Hours were fun. But I think Cinderella, even in the public's mind, put Disney back on the map. Like, this is... Siri, you know that these are wonderful classic films and so on. And I think, and and for, and I and please forgive me if I if I step on any toes, but I think the timing of Cinderella in 1950, without Cinderella, other things don't happen, right? Yeah. In it later on that year, I think on Christmas in 1950, the Disney's first ever television show, One Hour in Wonderland, debuts mm-hmm. on NBC. Without the the financial fortitude to make that happen, it doesn't they get into live action films with Treasure Island, right? Walt is able to expand his already expansive vision for animation into dipping his toes into live action, not just shorts, but feature films with things like Treasure Island. Exactly. So next on my list is the obvious because I, I couldn't not put it on my list and, and you know, my, my, my heart is in the theme parks. My primary focus is in the theme parks and, and that we cannot overlook the opening of Disneyland in 1955. Now, again, there are things that lead up to this that are significant as well, right? So three years earlier when Wed M- Enterprises is, is founded to help create Disneyland, uh, which obviously becomes Walt Disney Imagineering, but and we could do an entire episode on this, but Mm -hmm. this, this desire there's, there's this romanticized sentimental part of me. And I smile as I say this, that really wants to believe that Disneyland was created because he wanted this place for children and adults and grandparents to have fun together, not necessarily it being a revenue generating thing. This is the next big thing to make money. I think it did come from his own 
personal desires. I, I want to believe, and I do believe, the stories of Walt and his daughters at, at, at Griffith Park and riding the carousel and eating peanuts because that's, you know, it's Walt's fairy tale that is that is rooted in reality. But again, I also sort of switch to there's there's the business side of me too, right? That opening day, that Black Sunday with all the issues that it had from counterfeit tickets to unfinished attractions, a heat wave, plumbing that didn't work. Like, Walt, you want the toilets to work or do you want, <laughs> do you want the, the fountains to work? You know, and women's, we, we heard stories about women's heels because he used to wear heels to the park. Women's heels yeah. sinking into the, the pavement. Those initial challenges and hiccups did not deter the parks or Waltz or the company's long-term success. What does this do, right? What does this single park do, not just for us as Disney fans, but it revolutionizes the amusement park industry. There is no theme park before Disneyland. Before Disneyland, there were just amusement parks that had collections of rides. They weren't even attractions with no central theme. Disneyland introduced this idea of themed land. It's a hub and spoke immersive storytelling. Walt wanted you to live these fairy tales in three dimensions. He literally, again, sets a new standard for the interest for the industry from an economic impact. This is not just impacting the Walt Disney company. Anaheim's not on the map before this, right? Disneyland literally transforms this quiet suburban area into this very bustling, which is an understatement, tourist destination and the businesses and the revenue that comes into this part of California and impacts the lives of in this monstrous ripple effect, you know, can't be understated. It also creates the way it paves the way for the creation of the expansion of the brand worldwide, not just in Florida, but Japan and Paris and Hong Kong and Shanghai and insert next destination. But, you know, I, I, Tim, I tried to think about this in, in the most expansive way, because I think there is the, this, this huge cultural impact. Maybe this is a separate show and a separate conversation for another day. The, the cultural impact, the global influence that this park has. And, you know, we've seen countless other theme parks, amusement parks, entertainment destinations attempt to replicate the Disney model, but it's always sort of this building on the foundation and trying to tweak and innovate on the foundation that Disneyland sets. And, you know, I think about Walt Disney, the person, which for me is such an important part of everything we talk about. And I think Disneyland was a very personal project for Walt and, and continues to stand as really a testament to his vision and creativity and, you know, this embodiment in in a belief that there is a magical place where stories can come to life and more importantly, families can and have and will continue to create lasting memories together. I, yeah, I mean, I'm a sappy under- guy. I can't help it. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I, you got me. You, the tears are flowing. Here. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Disneyland. Obviously, it's on the list. Actually, I'm going to piggyback on this. This may count as my next entry or not, depending on, well, what you think. So I'm going to go with this because Disneyland, obviously important. It's the park and and, and so on. But it, there were several other reasons why this was a big milestone event a big important time period disney history one thing just reflecting that before 1955 it's kind of funny to think about this before 1955 disney the company was cartoons and movies that was it after 1955 disney is movies cartoons parks cruise ships uh, uh destination it's 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 like part two and it's realizing where that line falls it's kind of interesting to look back in 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 disney history and see where that divide comes but with disneyland there were a few other things that happened uh in hand in hand with it that were important for their independent independent reasons as time moved forward one of them was this you, you mentioned roy and Walt and Roy's business acumen and that being not uh, Walt's strong suit necessarily, but it would always it, it kind of perpetually always 
had a little tension between them, Walt wanting to push the 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 boundaries and the frontiers of what could be done, and Roy saying, wait, how much is that going to cost? And <laughs> and back and forth and back and forth. So Disneyland was one of these. And this um, scenario led to a couple things. One of these was Walt coming up with the idea, well, Walt, Walt and Roy coming up with the idea of how do we finance this? Well, here's an idea. There's this newfangled thing out there, this television thing. Have you heard of this? <laughs> it's pretty cool. Why don't we approach one of the television networks and see if they would be willing to go in with us to help us finance this idea you have? And that's how they got together with ABC. And in exchange for doing a show for ABC, uh, the Disney show that ABC would love to have because it's Disney. We put them on TV. That'll help us. And ABC agreed to help finance the park. So that that's how the very close relationship with Disney and TV got started because of the necessity of how do we pay for Disneyland? And, of course, that led to all the Sunday shows that we all know and love, the live action shows that we adored. The other thing that came about was when Walt put together a group of people to work on ideas for this park. And he wanted to separate a little bit from the movie people and the studio part. So in 1953, he formed a separate company called Walt Disney Inc. to work on some of the ideas for this park and taking some people with him to do so. This is a company that eventually became Walt Disney Imagineering and was born out of necessity for we need an R&D section of the company to work on ideas for this thing that nobody's done before. So. It's not only was Disneyland important just by for starting the whole theme park idea in the first place, but it also started the the Disney TV relationship, started Imagineering, and really started honestly a whole second big part of the story of the Disney story. Now it's not just movies; it's movie movies plus all this other stuff. So I love that you you have this and you sort of separated it out because I think Waltz and Roy, right? I, I think we, we've done a show in the past about the importance of Roy Disney. And I'm, maybe I'll, I'll bring that up this week as our archive episode, because their vision for Disneyland and the television ventures were groundbreaking, but the financial challenges of bringing these ideas to life were significant to say the least. And I think it was innovative and additionally groundbreaking at the time to recognize the potential benefits of things like corporate partnerships and leveraging them to secure funding and getting support. Why? One, well, because you create these mutually beneficial arrangements, right? Disney gives companies the opportunity to showcase their products and service in this novel, engaging storytelling environment, which now turns Disneyland into a living, breathing, 360 degree, all five senses advertisement without feeling like it's an advertisement. In return, obviously, Disneyland and Disney gets the capital to build and maintain the attraction. So now Disney's financial burden is reduced, which is a brilliant, innovative funding idea again born out of necessity because when he first conceived of Disneyland he faced skepticism is the understatement of mm -hmm. Walt Disney listen you only need one yes right I, and I talk about this all the time Walt Disney was turned down not once not twice hundreds of times by potential financiers being told that Disneyland was a bad idea now by turning to the corporate sponsors He's able to secure funds from companies like Coca-Cola and Ford and Monsanto, which allow them allow the companies to sponsor specific attractions, showcasing their brand in a way that they could not do on their own. They get funding for Disneyland. But you're right. It continues because when he strikes the deal with ABC, ABC you know, to produce a Disneyland show, Disney ABC now provides significant funding for the construction of Disneyland. Same thing, dual purpose, entertains audience, acts as a promotional tool for the upcoming park. Like absolutely brilliant in in concept and execution. And I think from a from a corporate perspective too, Tim, it allows 
the companies to, in, well, it allows both of them, right? It allows Disney and the companies to integrate and showcase new technologies into the park. Think about things like Monsanto's House of the Future that had not just futuristic designs, but new and innovative material that were, you know, brand new to, to people. It also establishes, I think, for not just the park, but for Disney as this this continuing and growing reputation of being a place and a company of innovation. And I think also, too, from a corporate perspective, there's also, you know, these are not short term, you know, sponsored for a year. It creates these long term relationships and trusts that many of which are still, you know, continuing to this day. And I think that longevity is a testament to those benefits and and that trust that was established between Disney and the partnerships, you know, enhancing the brand image for for both sides and, you know, diversifying the revenue streams as well. I, I think I love the fact that you pull this one out because I think Disney's foresight in in establishing these corporate partnerships was nothing short of brilliant. So next time you see that sign brought to you by whoever, <laughs> give a little give a little applause. It's easy to look at those uh, relationships cynically, I guess, and but they are vitally important. And you know, you you explain why they are, and we'll we're going to hit on this, I'm sure, later in the show. How so much of the Epcot concept, not just the city but the park, as it became, had so much to do with partnerships and sponsorships and all that but that's a story for maybe if uh 10 or 20 minutes later in the show i'm sure because <laughs> it's your turn well hold on a second tim because i need to have a sip of my icy cold coca-cola no i'm <laughs> <laughs> um so I'm, I'm going in in relative chronological order and i don't i hate to be the guy that that is going to bring down the room but i need to oh no because in 1966, Walt Disney passes away on December 15th because of complications from lung cancer. And the reason why I feel it necessary to mark this as a milestone moment in in the history of the company was, you know, look, and, and if you've seen, and, and, and please make the pilgrimage to the Walt Disney Family Museum, which is... Mm -hmm a remarkable place and has a very respectful and beautiful and moving tribute to Walt and his passing. But, you know, he was such a hands on leader and was so actively involved in not just the numerous ongoing projects, but the future direction of the company that the immediate aftermath of his passing led you know, again, understating a significant void in the company. I, I literally imagine executives just gathering around a table, just staring at each other like, what do we do next? Because we've lost our leader. We've lost the face and the voice of the company. We've lost this creative genius. And I think there was probably concern and wonder, can the company, I'm sure it could continue, but could it continue to innovate and thrive in his absence? Now, the, the, you know, there's always a silver lining to every, you know, sad thing. I think the, the, the good that comes out of this and understand how I, what I mean by that is in this, this moment of sadness and turmoil and frustration and concern, Roy's brother, Walt's brother, Roy O. Disney, postpones his own retirement to ensure and oversee the completion of not just Disney World, but what would be Walt Disney World, right? Walt's true passion project. And when this all happens, you know, from a from purely corporate and sort of executive perspective, there's a lot of shift happening, right? There's a lot of changes in in leadership and direction. And while the company continued to focus on animation and theme parks, there was also this shift towards corporate strategy and diversification and expansion, which, you know, I think when we think about 
Roy and, and what he did in finishing Walt Disney World and, and the incredible impact that that have and that selfless sacrifice that he gave to ensure that his brother's vision became a reality. It also did lead from a, a, a longer term impact and influence. It led to, you know, this this continuing shift in in focus on expansion and diversification again into television, right? As they acquire ABC into film, they start establishing uh, um, and, and acquiring other companies. And then later into things like computer animation, right? They, you know, the, remember the late seventies and early eighties, there was this decline in the quality and success in some of the animated films. And it wasn't until the late eighties and nineties and with that Disney Renaissance that Disney once again, regained its prominent uh, prominence in animation with things like mermaid beauty and the beast and the lion king and you know i think i think even after walt's passing and after roy came and then did what he did and then left the company i think even though walt was gone his influence was definitely seen and felt on so many projects obviously you know epcot being his vision for a utopian city while while Maybe what we have now is certainly different from his original vision was in, inspired by, you know, his ideas. Um, but I think Walt's passing sort of, I don't know how to articulate it. Like, I think it sort of reinforced this perception that Disney was not just a company, right? It's not just this this corporate entity, but it was a brand whose it was a company whose brand was so deeply associated with the values and dreams and visions of his found of, of the founder and Walt's continuing personal touch and the storytelling ability and the emphasis on family entertainment, like really solidified those as being the foundational pillars for that brand. So even though there was growth, even though there was diversification, those ideals and visions and those that Continuing emphasis, and I think we're seeing it again on creativity and innovation, continue to shape the company decades after his passing. Oh, well said. You covered a lot there. I, th I think you knocked out a few that I was going to talk Sorry. About. <laughs> but Because um, as I'm talking, no, like, my, well, main, like I, my mind starts going <laughs> in a different direction. So. Well, I was trying to think of how to talk about um, Walt Disney World and Epcot. And I, I guess you you kind of did it in a way I was going for, like not yes, new like Disneyland, new park, uh, and so on. But it's more it's much more complicated than that. And um, uh, especially with Epcot, like you said, it was it, not just the opening of a new park and a park in Florida, but how the company moves on after Walt and and how they bring Epcot to life, uh, what they end up doing. Um, but I, th I think as you're going forward, as you're talking about milestone moments in Disney history, for better or worse, and again, another one of those tumultuous times, you kind of talked about it, but I guess we should talk about the uh, the near hostile takeover bid that did take place <laughs> in the 80s and um, and what it meant. And you could tie this to the Disney Renaissance, which you talked about, too. And I, I mean, the story of how the takeover almost came to be how Roy E. Disney was involved, his role, how Eisner and Frank Wells came in. It's a long story. It's complicated. I've written it again. I still don't understand all the nuances. <laughs> right. That's why I'm not flying in a jet plane right now. But um, I, I guess the short of it is it's, it was another time when now that Walt's gone, Roy's gone, uh, the Disney leadership is is moving into – people's hands that aren't part of the Disney family anymore. So, you know, there is a decline in uh, quality of animation and films. Some people see it that way. Um, the upshot of it is as Eisner and Wells come in for whatever you want to say later that happened, um, basically saving the company, bringing in what a lot of people call the Disney deck out decade now of the 1990s and how Eisner oversaw the expansion of, the Epcot Resort area uh, added two new parks, the studios and Animal Kingdom. Uh, the Disney Renaissance started getting underway in the late 80s and uh, uh, 
uh, had full steam in the 90s and Beauty and the Beast becoming the first animated picture to be nominated for Best Picture. Um, it was a time when uh, Disney could have fallen off the rails and gone a different direction. And uh, it's it's again, the, the story of it is very long and complex, but going through it and seeing how they came out on the other side with not having gone a a corporate route that might not have turned out very well, but instead us getting not one, but two new parks in Walt Disney World, um, breaking ground in parks around the globe, a new resurgence in the quality of animated films uh, leading to several that are classics to this day. Um, you, you have to look at that as uh, one of the most important periods in Disney's history. Um hard to explain and and like i said i think you know, the looking back on michael eisner's place in disney history uh is kind of all over the place many of you talked to but at the time really came in and saved the company and mm. and i still remember watching what was the movie you're watching probably rescuers down under or something like that with michelle and seeing them and them talking about the anaheim mighty ducks and we're going to win a stanley <laughs> cup and thanks a lot and all that but it, it was an exciting time in disney history i think a lot of us look back on the nineties as a great time to go to the parks. There was, you know, and, and the movies and so forth. So the Renaissance and the near hostile takeover, not the only hostile takeover bid that would come, but mm. one of the first of many, but a very important time in Disney history. You know, I remember, um, I remember this in, in like the fall of, of 1984. And remember this was pre-internet. So our access to information and speed of information, et cetera, was, was, you know, exponentially limited versus what we have today. But I remember all of this happening and, and you're right. It, it was, it was very complicated, you know, from a, a corporate perspective, but, you know, looking back, if you sort of take a, a 30,000 foot 2020 hindsight view, you know, during the eighties, the, the company from a movie making perspective, right? Walt Disney Productions, a huge decline in the film business and even the theme park revenue was sort of stagnant. And Ron Miller, who was Walt's son-in-law and was CEO at the time was really getting, and maybe appropriately so a lot of, if not all of the criticism for the lackluster to say the least of the company. And there was this, massive perceived undervaluation of the company. And when that happens, other companies target these undervalued companies as a possible target for corporate raiders, right? What they do is they'll come in, they'll break up the company and they'll sell its assets. And there were a number of different um, takeover attempts that were sort of happening kind of all at the same time because mm -hmm. the shareholders are dissatisfied with the leadership. The company is struggling. The management style decisions are not making anybody happen happy. So you, you see it, the name Disney and you think this is the person that's going to be like the savior. And he's not like Roy E. Disney, the son of Roy O. Disney plays a very pivotal role in sort of what happens next. And, he he sort of redesigned the the board and with Stanley Gold launches this campaign to get Miller out. And then Sid Bass, who's a, a billionaire investor, became a, a huge, significant shareholder of the company and sort of led that move to change the leadership. So the 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 good that happens from this, like you said, is that. Miller is out, but Michael Eisner, who was the CEO of Paramount, comes in and and Michael Eisner is sort of like my dream. If anybody listening, if you know Michael Eisner, he's my dream interview. I don't want to talk to him because I think people remember Michael Eisner for the way he came out, not the way he came yeah. in and the work that he did. But Eisner and Frank Wells, who was brought in from Warner Brothers, he was appointed president of Walt Disney Productions. And under the two of them, and I mean this with the utmost reverence and respect, like a Walt and Roy, right? There was the creative face of the company with Eisner. There was the, you know, sort of the the maybe the more business savvy, you know, person. Not that not that Eisner was not business savvy, but between the two of them, there is this revitalization, right? The renaissance in the animation division, the expansion of the theme parks, 
strategic acquisitions like ABC and ESPN. And I think they also helped refocus the corporate culture and being a little bit more aggressive in terms of more commercially driven and, um, you know, while some people liked it because it helped raise the bottom line, some people didn't like it because they felt that maybe Disney was moving away from some of their original values. Although I'm sure Walt like making, <laughs> like making money too, but yeah. this change setting the stage for Disney's growth into being the dominant entertainment company that it is today. And you actually, you explain that takeover bid very well. <laughs> That is such a complicated. Story. It's very complicated, and, I, and I'm and I'm. Forgive me if I got any of the the details, you know, close incorrect. Enough, close but enough. Um, but I remember yeah, that's why that's why we're not playing in that arena. So. You know, and I remember Tim. I remember like being worried um, mm-hmm. at the time. Like I'm like, what you know? Because Disney seemed and continues to almost seem like you know it's more than a company to us, right? It it means more, and the idea of someone quote unquote, from the outside, or in this case, from the inside, wanting to break up this thing that Walt created, like there, there is like, there's an emotional component to that, which I don't think you necessarily see in, in other corporations because of the, the, the meaning that Disney has to us. And and when it starts to become sort of black and white and numbers on a spreadsheet and corporate takeovers, it almost taints a little bit this romanticized vision of what we have, you know, the company to be. The, the, and the funny thing is, and, and I, we, we talk about this a lot is your, your go with me here, your notion of what Disney means to you personally. I mean, it's different for everybody and it, it really depends on actually it solely depends on when you first started having your, when your Disney life started. Um, that's why some people, love some attractions and some could care less. It's the one they grew up with like that. The Jeremy iron spaceship earth is my spaceship earth. That's the <laughs> one I want. It wasn't the first, it was the last, but that's mine. And for us, we uh, meaning my family nineties is when we really got into Disney. That's when our daughter was born. That's when she started watching the films. That's when we started really going to the theater to watch films as a family. That's when we started going to the parks a lot. I mean, we had been, when we were little, but not so much, but the nineties is when we started. So the, the Eisner Renaissance Disney, that's the Disney we grew up with. So to me, Michael Eisner is like my hero. Cause mm-hmm. that's why we love Disney in the nineties. We loved going to see the Lion King and little mermaid and all that. So uh, it's funny. Cause that's to someone who grew up in, you know, the fifties and the sixties, seventies, their Disney is, Walt Disney and ours is more it's the Michael Eisner Disney that brought us in. So, you know, it does mean a little something extra special. Well, and, you know, as we were talking about this, too, and I don't know that I've ever done an entire show about him, but I think I if I haven't. I will. You know, I think to a certain degree, like Walt, uh, like Roy, Frank Wells does not get the attention mm-hmm. and the recognition he deserves. And. And I mean this, you know, one for the what he did, you know, in terms of the work he did. But I think of also what he did for Michael Eisner, because when Frank Wells died in 1994 in a helicopter crash, right? We know he was an avid skier. He did the seven summits. His death had an impact on Disney that. I don't know, Tim, if any other person other than Walt may have have had Mm -hmm. such a huge ripple effect. And what I mean by that is because he was sort of the the yin and yang to Michael Eisner, who and, and, you know, he was from what I understand and what I've read and from even folks I've talked to, he was, uh, you know, he helped sort of balance Eisner and was very much a, a calming force. And without him, Eisner sort of pulls back, becomes a little bit more isolated. And now there's a there's a domino effect because Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was the chairman of the studios, have this huge falling out. Katzenberg's leaves Disney. They start DreamWorks with uh, David Geth- Geffen and Steven Spielberg. And I think Michael Eisner, unfortunately, did lose 
that person, he lost his Roy. He lost his person who was able to help balance him to to whatever you want to want to call it. And, you know, ultimately led to, you know, Eisner, you know, leaving a number of years later. Um, but, yeah, I think I think Frank Wells, you know, sometimes yeah. doesn't get get what he deserves in terms of, of notoriety and recognition. That concludes part one of our look at the top 10 milestone moments from the past 100 years of the Disney Company. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what we've discussed so far. Come be part of the community and conversation over in the WW Radio Clubhouse at www.radio.com slash clubhouse and stay tuned for part two next week. It's time for our Disney trivia question of the week, where if you think you know the answer, you can enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. And this week's trivia contest is brought to you by Who Smarted. Are you a parent, an educator, or a caretaker of kids? Are you looking for another podcast you can listen to with your kids? Well, if you're looking for a screen-free, yay, way to entertain your kids while showing them how fun and exciting educational learning can be, then Who Smarted is your perfect podcast. Because this is one of those rare podcasts for kids and adults that kids actually enjoy listening to. And that means all content is kid safe and parent approved. From the creators of Brain Games and Brain Child is the funniest, most creative educational podcast designed for awesome five to eight year olds and their parents. And Who Smarted combines funny storytelling, cool characters, and surprising sound effects to create a world that curious kids and their parents and caretakers love to enjoy. Kids are taught amazing science and history facts on fascinating topics for the parents as well. And there are so many great episodes, but I recommend checking out the one on Lego. Learn how they were invented and what does Lego even mean? And there's a really interesting one on body temperature, like how your body regulates its temperature and what happens when we get too hot or too cold. And yes, I'm really looking forward to checking out the history of stuffed animals, but you and your kids, I promise, will be binging the entire feed of Who Smarted before you know it. So join this educational universe created by STEM consultants, writers, and producers who strive to ignite, amplify, and satisfy children's natural curiosity. You can find Who Smarted on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, before we get to this week's trivia question, let's go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So we are in the Halloween season, and I've recently done a couple of episodes on the archives part of the feed with Jim Corcus about the history of Halloween. And last week, I asked you to tell me, what was the very first year that a Halloween party was held in Walt Disney World? And what was I said? A Halloween party, not the not-so-scary Halloween party. Thanks to all of you who entered, got this one correct, and knew that the answer was 1972. That's right. Less than a year after the park first opened, on October 28th and 29th, 1972, Walt Disney World advertised in newspapers, Halloween Weekend. Now, while that might not have been the most creative name in the world, it conveyed what it was, and part of the highlights included free, yes, free admission into the Haunted Mansion, which was a big deal because if you remember, at that time, Walt Disney World was using the A through E ticket books, and the Haunted Mansion was an E ticket, which was the most expensive. There were also character appearances, but not necessarily in Halloween costumes. There was a screenings of cartoons like The Legends of Sleepy Hollow. There were magic shows. And this was not a separate ticketed event. You just purchased regular admission on those two days and you could participate in all of the Halloween weekend activities. It was so popular that they repeated it next year in 1973 on October 27th and 28th. And then, as we mentioned on that show, it started to evolve. And in 1979, there was a Halloween party called Halloween Hysteria at Magic Kingdom, which was part of their World Series of Entertainment. This was the first sort of separate ticketed event that eventually led to the creation of Mickey's not-so-scary Halloween party. But I digress. Anyway, I took all the correct entries, randomly selected one, and last week you were playing for a new WW Radio 3D keychain and a Halloween-themed mystery Disney prize. And last week's winner, randomly selected, is Dean Caldwell. So, Dean, congratulations. I have your address, and we'll get your prize package out to you right away. And if you played last week and didn't win, 
That's okay, because here's your next chance to enter in this week's not Walt Disney World, but Disney Trivia Challenge. So we are talking about the legacy of the Disney company as we celebrate 100 years and some of the milestone moments, including, but not limited to, and I know there was a lot that we didn't get to talk about, including what were Mickey Mouse's first on-screen spoken words? That's your question for this week. What were Mickey Mouse's first on-screen spoken words? You have until Sunday, October 29th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern to go to www.radio.com and click on this week's podcast. Again, you're going to play for a WW Radio 3D keychain and another mystery prize. So good luck and have fun. Thank you for taking the time and tuning in this week. I understand how valuable your time is, and I appreciate you spending and sharing it with me. I hope you had fun, learned something new, and that the show brought a little or a lot of happiness and some Disney magic to your day or week. And speaking of bringing some Disney magic direct to you wherever you are, if you can't get to the parks, it's one of the reasons why I love doing live video every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. This coming Wednesday is one of my favorite live shows of the year where we get a golf cart at Fort Wilderness Resort and Campground and tour all of the incredible Halloween decorations, attractions, and experiences that campers put up on their campsites It is a lot of fun, and it's a great way for you to enjoy it from the comfort of your home, your desk, your couch, bed, wherever you watch from. This Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern at www.radiolive.com or on the WW Radio page on Facebook at facebook.com slash WW Radio. Please continue to be part of the community and conversation over in the WW Radio Clubhouse at www.radio.com slash clubhouse. You can also connect with me on social. I am at Lou Mangiello on all the social platforms. If you have a question you'd like me to answer on an upcoming episode, you can email me lou at www.radio.com or call the voicemail with a comment about this week's show, a question, or just a hello from the parks at 407 900 939 Special thanks go out to our new and longtime members of our WW Radio Nation family. I appreciate your love, support, friendship, and help, and I love being able to give back to you each and every month and collectively support our Dream Team project, which benefits the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. Thanks to you and your support of the nation, you help bring every episode of the show to life for as little as a dollar per month. And you can get cool exclusive rewards every month, like scavenger hunts, trivia quests. We have our monthly group video call. Get access to our private Facebook group, their shirts, stickers, monthly care packages, early access and discounts to special events, and much more. I want to thank some new and longtime members, including Vicky, Lindsay Conforto, Amanda Messina, Josh Olive, and Aaron. None of this happens without you. And if you want to find out how you can help the show, you can visit www.radio.com slash support. Speaking of our Dream Team project, which benefits the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America, it is the most important part of what I do. It is something I've been supporting since I started writing my very first book back in 2004. And thanks to you and our collective fundraising efforts, we've raised more than $550,000 to date, granting countless wishes to help children with life-threatening illnesses and their families visit Walt Disney World. I specifically mention this again now because thanks to a generous anonymous benefactor who has stepped forward, has made an incredible offer and invitation because every donation made to our Dream Team project between now and November 1st will be matched up to $10,000. That means that your contribution will have double the impact in making dreams come true for these kids. Whether it's a dollar or anything more, it will be matched up to a total of $10,000 until November 1st. If you want to find out more including how to donate, you can visit www.radio.com slash dream team and make your donation directly to make a wish. Remember your gift, no matter how much the size will help create life changing wishes for these children. You'll also be emailed a receipt for your records and any tax purposes. So let's harness the power of this incredible community that you have helped to create to bring smiles, hope and joy to these kids who need magic most. And speaking of making magic, huge thanks to my travel partner and sponsor and my friend Becky Mankin from MEI and Mouse Fan Travel who have made an incredibly generous donation 
to our Dream Team Project once again this year and just for everything they do on a daily basis to help you, my friend, whether you're planning a next trip to Walt Disney World, Cruise Line, Disneyland, or any vacation or business travel destination, visit mousefantravel.com for not just the best possible prices, all available discounts, but most importantly, the level of personal care, attention, and service that they give. And of course, all of their services come at absolutely no cost to you. Again, visit them over at mousefantravel.com. And in addition to staying connected and everything that we do together online, I still believe that nothing beats a handshake and a hug. So go check out our events page at www.com slash events and find out how, when, and where we can get together again or for the first time. Upcoming events include, but are not limited to, our next meet of the month, which is going to be the weekend of November 4th in Magic Kingdom, just in time for the wine and dine weekend. I'll be at the Swan and Dolphin Food and Wine Classic Friday and Saturday, November 10th and 11th. It is my favorite foodie event of the year. You can learn more and get tickets at foodandwineclassic.com. Your ticket entitles you to unlimited unlimited food and beverages on the causeway plus there's live entertainment educational seminars and much more again learn more at foodandwineclassic.com i'll also be at jollywood night at disney's hollywood studios brand new event this year on monday november 20th there's no official meetup or anything but i'm calling it WDW Radio Night at Jollywood Nights for anyone who's there wants to get together and enjoy this brand new event together. This is a separate ticketed event, not by me, but directly through Disney. And we have two cruises upcoming, including October 21st through the 26th, 2024, our five night first time Halloween on the high seas group cruise on the Disney Magic out of Fort Lauderdale to Nassau and Lookout Key at Lighthouse Point, the brand new private island port from Disney. And of course, we have to sail on the brand new Disney treasure, February 8th through the 15th, 2025, seven night Western Caribbean, Cozumel, Georgetown, Grand Cayman, Jamaica, and Castaway Key. And oh, by the way, we're also going to be celebrating WDW Radio's 20th anniversary. To learn more, get a free new obligation quote, you can visit www.radio.com slash cruises. Please also visit LouMangelo.com because in addition to everything I do here at WW Radio, I'm also a keynote speaker and coach on a mission to share the magic of Disney and to help entrepreneurs and solopreneurs build their brand and business through one-on-one coaching, a weekly mastermind group which is forming now, and events including my Momentum event in the fall and retreat coming up this spring. So if you're looking to turn what you love into what you do, you can reach out and find out how we can work together for coaching and mentoring. Or if you're looking to bring a speaker into your organization, your event, or your conference to leverage customer service strategies from Disney, leadership lessons from Walt Disney, as well as inspiring practical and tactical lessons through presentations and workshops. Again, you can reach out to me directly by going to lumangelo.com. And if you like the show, and I hope that you do, all I ask that you please help spread the word, tell a friend that you're listening, rate or review the show over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Go answer our question of the week in the Spotify podcast player app. And finally, most importantly, Always remember to choose the good and be a positive light and inspiration for others. And please always know just how grateful I sincerely am to you and for you for allowing me and giving me the gift of being able to share what I love so very much with you. I hope that this is your best week ever. If there's ever anything I can do to help you, please reach out and let me know. So until next time, see ya. Hey, Lou, this is Alex Byers um, calling from Orlando, Florida. It's been a while since I've called in, but I just got listen- um, I just got finished listening to um, one of the um, – so 749 and top 10 spooky things at Halloween. And I want to say that um, this, this show kind of made me a little sad, sad because – that most of the attractions that um, was talked about in this podcast, of course, it's from the vault, um, one of the vaults. Um, but a lot of these attractions are gone now or soon will be gone, like Tough to Be a Bug, and um, some of them have been reimagined into other attractions. So I had an idea for you. And you may have done this in the past. I may have missed it. But two top ten, two, two top ten ideas for you. One, a top ten of things you miss the most at the Disney Park, and ten things that you're glad that's gone. And I know that that sounds crazy, 
But there are some things that I think us as Disney fans and fanatics that's been going to the parks for for a while, maybe, maybe not even for a while, but um, there's some attractions that I'm glad that are gone, a.k.a. Disney's Great Escape. That was, I think that's number one on my list. I remember going on that ride, and I think I was like 10 or 11, and I was so scared, and I I was thinking at the time, what was my father thinking? Let me on that ride. But um, I also wanted to share, um, I also listened to the, the latest show talking about um, just di- different fun things that you do on Halloween, so I just kind of wanted to share mine. So I am from a small town in Georgia, and we always celebrated Halloween. Um, the number one reason is because my mom's birthday is on Halloween. And so that's always something fun that I like to share with people because I think it's really cool. And we used to, back back in my small town, we used to dress up and, you know how small towns are, everybody knows everyone, everybody's friends. So we all had, there was a community hayride that we used to go on. This is like in the early 2000s before trunk or treats were even a thing. We used to go on a big community hayride. And we would go from house to house in different neighborhoods. And even even when I used to go and I didn't trick or treat anymore, we used to still take my sisters. And it was just a fun time just to be with family and not only celebrate the holiday, but celebrate my mom as, as um, you know, celebrating another year that she's here. And very soon we'll celebrate her 48th birthday. Hey, Lou, I think I got cut off. But anyways, um, so one of the fun things about the hayride that we used to do is there was a, you know, cemetery graveyard um, in town, and they used to ride us through that cemetery and and try to be spooky and and you know try to tell like a little ghost story. And then all of a sudden, somebody would come out and just scare us all, and we would all be like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> like it literally is like my sisters were scarred by that for a couple of years. I didn't even want to go on the hayride anymore. But um but yeah, those are some of my fun memories about Halloween. Um, now with my husband and you know, we don't have kids yet, but we like to dress up our little doggy and and you know, celebrate with her or pass out candy. But I hope everyone has a great holiday, no matter if you celebrate Halloween, just or just celebrate the autumn season. Like it's so exciting to finally get that feeling of the holidays coming up with with Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas, and seeing the leaves change and just the crisp, cool air. We don't get that much here in Florida, but this week has been really nice. Um, So we like to pretend for a little bit that we're in our autumn girl season. But thank you so much again, Lou, for everything that you do. You really make um, me smile, and just if, if I'm having a bad day, I just turn on the podcast, and I just love listening to all your top tens and just everything that you do to to really spread not only Disney knowledge but just joy and happiness to everyone. And so hope you're doing well and wishing everyone here in the WW Radio community family a happy Halloween and hope you have a great holiday season. Talk to you soon.